Hello, how's everyone doing today? I'm here with special guest Walter Block. Walter Block is an Austrian economist. He teaches at Life City. He's the author of such books as Defending the Undefendable 1, Defending the Undefendable 2, uh, I think a third one which will be in the works, uh, The Case for Discrimination, uh, and a lot of other good works. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Thanks for having me on your show again. Uh, always a pleasure. Uh, a lot of interesting topics. Um, okay, so I, I think the first one that I want to talk about uh, is, uh, which is a very controversial one, uh, is uh, parental n neglect. Uh, you know, um, I'm not opposed to uh, being provocative, uh, and obviously based on the title of, uh, title of your books, neither are you. Um, but I, I think that if, if, we are, if we want people to, uh, if we want more libertarians to adopt a position which is provocative, but which I believe is not really the libertarian position, can turn off people needlessly. So I think that even though that this uh, it would be a rare occurrence, it may turn off a lot of people. So if it's not even really uh, consistent with libertarianism, why needlessly turn people away? So I think it is important to, t to uh, talk about this issue. So uh, uh, I'll talk first, I guess, Murray Rothbard, because he, he's the main proponent of it, which basically uh, Murray Rothbard says that there are no problems I agree with and that uh, a, a, ch a parent has no obligation to feed his children. And Murray also claims that uh, no one has an obligation to feed anyone else. And if your neighbor has no obligation to feed uh, your children, why should you? And therefore, um, you should be able to um, allow your children to starve uh, if, 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 because otherwise you're forced to give them food. Now, uh, the problem with this, well, there are a few problems that I think with this line of reasoning. One, it's not a positive obligation. Uh, because a positive obligation, a po sorry, it's not a positive right, because a positive right is you're forced to do something irrespective of your actions. So if you see a person drowning in a river, do you have a positive obligation to save him from drowning? My answer isn't yes or no. My answer is it depends how he got in the river. If you pushed him in, you do, because he's in the river because of your actions. A child only exists because you created them, and therefore, you put them in a situation knowing that they are unable to fend for themselves. That's not analogous to a stranger who the fact that he's starving has nothing to do with your own actions. So I don't think it's analogous in the, ch in the case of children. Um, so uh, that's uh, why I think it's not analogous. And uh, uh, secondly, if, if, if we're going to take this to its logical conclusion with uh, rights comes responsibilities, and if a parent is un no, under no obligation to feed his child, then he's not un then if the child does something wrong, the parent is not responsible for that either. So if a five-year-old kills a kid, the five-year-old gets punished, not the parent, because the parent has no obligation to his children. Uh, when I let you uh, reply. Okay, well, you've uh, uh, said a lot, and uh, I, a lot of grist for our mill, and I agree with you that um, the key is not to uh, so much, uh, whether we turn off people or not is not the key. Uh, the key is really, is it compatible with libertarianism? And if it's not compatible with libertarianism, well, maybe I don't even agree with you. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, to me, the front and center and everything is being compatible with libertarianism. And I if agree. It turns off, and if it turns off people, the hell with them. <laughs> I agree. I don't think we should dilute the message. Right. We shouldn't dilute the message. We should just try to get pure libertarianism because it's important. It's beautiful. Uh, it's what uh, we do as professionals. And if it turns off people, well, then too bad for them. And if it doesn't turn off people, uh, <laughs> well, that's good. And, and obviously we should try to say it in a way that doesn't needlessly turn off people because we don't want to turn off people. We don't want to have a little esoteric uh, group. We do want to spread liberty, uh, but uh, that's just sort of a side condition. The key is to promote uh, liberty and, and to get accurate on what liberty is and, and not be thick libertarianism or thick libertarians or, or anything, any other deviations from the, the, the pure. Now, uh, so I think we're pretty much in agreement on that. And 
we really have two issues that are separate issues here, and I think we should probably discuss them one at a time, and I think you did sort of raised both of them. And one of them is the abortion eviction issue, pro-life, pro-choice. And the other is, now we have a kid, and uh, we don't want to take care of him anymore. We want to let him starve in, in, in the, the back bedroom and not tell anyone about that. And, and is this okay? Or rather, is this compatible with libertarianism, or is this murder? Uh, let's deal with the second question first, that namely, we have a kid, and uh, the parents don't like the kid anymore, he cries too much, he uh, dirties his diaper, whatever the reason is, they don't want to take care of him, and uh, they think that they have no positive obligations, because they've read a little bit about libertarianism, and uh, they think that they can just let the kid starve, and they're not murderers. And Murray could be interpreted as supporting this, but I think that would be an unfortunate uh, interpretation of him. And in any case, uh, our, our goal, I think, is not so much what did Murray say, but, you know, what is the truth? And Murray's not around anymore, so we just have to do the best we can. You know, I sometimes feel in the Godfather movie, when the Godfather died, they said half their power is lost because he had all these connections and stuff. And I, I th sometimes think that Murray died, and not only half our power as libertarians died, but half our power as, as um, Austrian economists died, because Murray was just so powerful and so wonderful, which doesn't mean he was perfect. You know, we, we can disagree with him. Uh, we're not a cult. We're allowed to disagree. But uh, I would say Murray was the equivalent of every other Austrian put together or every other uh, libertarian put together in terms of intellectual and moral power. Okay, so uh, my view is, uh, uh, first of all, I have to show you a little picture. Can you see that, A, B, C? Yeah. Is it seen? And uh, the question, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an analogy between homesteading land and and this baby that we're thinking of leaving alone in the back room to starve. So the question is, are you allowed to homestead in the bagel format or in the, uh, what do you call it format, the uh, donut format uh, with a hole in the middle, uh, the B? Are you uh, allowed, according to libertarianism, to homestead in, in the B format, namely leaving A, the area A, let's say a square mile or a round mile, uh, leaving it alone? And I say you're not. And this is controversial, but I say you're not allowed to do that. But if you do that, you, you have to allow some sort of path so that other people can get to A. Because if you if you do uh, homestead B and now own B and not A, what you're doing is precluding or forestalling people from getting to A if you don't allow a path in for them. And now you're controlling A without having homesteaded it, which is a no-no. Because uh, according to the Lockean, Rothbardian, uh, Hoppian view of homesteading, and I think these are the three main people that have contributed to libertarian homesteading theory, uh, uh, you, you can't do that because th then you're controlling area A, the hole in the bagel or the square mile in the middle, and you haven't touched it, and, and that's unfair because the, the whole goal of homesteading is to, you know, privatize every. My motto when I send out emails is, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it, and since everything either moves or doesn't move, privatize everything. But now you can't privatize everything because somebody's hogging up A without uh, privatizing it, without homesteading it. Okay, so now what, what, is this, what has this got to do with babies? What this has got to do with babies is that there's a perfect analogy. Namely, the parent who uh, 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 won't feed the kid and, and doesn't tell anyone about it and doesn't go to the orphanage with the kid and doesn't go to the... Uh, church or the hospital or something like that is precluding or forestalling that kid. That kid is, is like A. Uh, that kid, the, the baby, the toddler in his crib, uh, you have an obligation not to feed him uh, because there are no positive obligations, but not to preclude other people from feeding him who want to feed him. And by not going to the a hospital or the orphanage or the church or the synagogue or whatever uh, or announcing, you know, this kid we no longer want and anyone else wants him, we'll give him up. That would be equivalent to putting in this path so that people can get into the A area. So I say uh, 
that in order to be a parent, you have to be a guardian, you have to take care of the kid. So you can't own the kid, but you can own the rights to be the guardian. And how do you own the rights to be the guardian? By keeping uh, the kid alive, by you know keeping them uh, healthy and fed and whatever. And when you no longer want to do it, then you are obligated to let other people know about it, uh, you know, through the the orphanage or whatever. And if you don't do that, you're a murderer. So when you do believe in positive obligation? No, I say it's not a positive. Go, going to the orphanage. In a positive obligation, you have to go there. That's an action. No, absolutely not. And I spent a lot of time on this in my writings, and, and I'll fight you to the death over this one. It's not a positive obligation. Rather, the way I concoct this, because I, I really have two goals here. One, I don't want to violate positive obligations. And two, the idea of people starving their kid in the back room is horrendous. And my attempt to reconcile this is to say, no, it's not a positive obligation. It's just... The failure to preclude. In other words, do you have a positive obligation to let people in uh, to A? No, it's not a positive obligation. Rather, you uh, have an obligation to do it because if you don't do it, you're a dirty rat. You're a uh, you're controlling stuff that you're not homesteading, namely the area A. And similarly, it's not a positive obligation to tell other people about the starving baby. Rather. If you don't do it, you're a murderer because you're precluding, you're forestalling, you're, uh, ho you're uh, having the rights to be a, a guardian without doing uh, what it takes to be a guardian. Namely, you're not homesteading the kid anymore. So as soon as you don't feed that kid on his regular feeding, let's say you feed him three times a day and, and it's in the morning and you don't feed him in the morning, you are a, a murderer. You are a, a precluder, you're a forestaller, you're acting like B. And, and you're violating libertarian rights. And therefore, in order to not violate libertarian rights, you've got to go to the orphanage. And it's not a positive obligation. It's rather an attempt to get out from under uh, being in violation of the libertarian code, which says uh, with land, you, you only have to homestead it once. But with a baby, you have to keep homesteading it. You have to keep feeding it because you can't own the baby. And all you can do is own the rights to be the guardian. And the way you can own the rights to be the guardian is to feed him. And if you don't feed him, you're no longer the guardian and you're precluding other people. Uh, let's say you or I who might uh, save this baby. You're, you're stopping us from doing it. So I want to have my cake and eat it. I want to have two things. I don't want starving babies. I want to consider parents who do that murderers. And I also don't want to violate the libertarian code of non-positive uh, 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 obligations. So uh, this is my way of, uh, of having our cake and eating it too. Okay, well, let, let's, well, to, to play devil's advocate a little, I, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm not understanding your position, but let's say, you know, in the case of adverse possession, a person doesn't want property anymore that is his. Does he have an obligation to let other people know about that or can he just leave saying it's not my property if someone uses it I'm not gonna press charges because I revoke ownership but I also don't want to go to the trouble of telling other people that. Well I think land is different than babies. Uh, with land you can just uh, you know abscond or with a house or with a car you can just sort of leave it somewhere well, not on other people's property but that would be trespass but let's say you own a house and a car and you want to I don't know, commit suicide, or you want to go to Timbuktu or wherever it is, you don't have an obligation to tell other people, hey, the, there's this house, there's this car, come get it, first come, first serve. You don't have an obligation to do that because once you've homesteaded it once or bought the car legitimately, you're the rightful owner of it. And and you're the owner of it in perpetuity. You can do whatever you want with it, although there's a whole question about abandoning property, which is a different issue. But children are different. Children... Um, uh, you can't own them, and you have to keep homesteading them if you want to be their guardian. And as soon as you stop homesteading, as soon as you miss one feed, well, okay, you miss one feeding, that might be a little extreme, you know, like uh, you're lost or something, you can't feed the kid for an hour or so, and you feed them a little later. We're not talking about that. We're talking about starving the kid purposefully. Uh, you, you, you can't do that. And... Um, and I, I think it doesn't violate the uh, the positive obligation thing. Rather, it's a way of getting out from under being a forestaller or a precluder. And being a forestaller or a precluder is illegitimate because you're acting like B. And uh, the key is the difference between abandoning your home and your car and um, uh, what do you call it, uh, abandoning your child, is that the child, you need continuous uh, homesteading. And as soon as you stop that homesteading, uh, you're a forestaller. Whereas when you 
leave your house and your car, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you didn't violate any libertarian uh, principles. Right. So maybe that's not a great example, but how about, let's say, an animal? You have to keep homesteading a dog, otherwise it dies. So if you don't want your dog anymore, do you have an obligation to go to the pound and, and tell other people, there's this dog, I don't want it anymore? No, I, I don't think so. I think you can kill your dog and eat your dog. Uh, I do have a thing about torturing dogs. I've written about that, uh, and um, my analysis. Well, that, we're getting off the subject. Uh, uh, um, although it's an interesting subject, <laughs> you know, torturing animals. I think you should be able to. I think you should be able to torture dogs too. Only humans have rights. But anyway, well, continue. I, I, uh, my analysis of that, and we'll get off the subject. But what the heck? It's fun, and you know, it's part of libertarianism. <laughs> and you know, there's no rule that we can't get off the subject for a minute. Uh, my analysis of, of that is that's pretty heinous and it's pretty disgusting I'm and uh, you know uh, we, we should boycott people like that but should it be against the law and now we get into thin and thick libertarianism. Thin libertarianism say, is a intra-human uh, philosophy. It says that human beings may not uh, initiate violence or threaten violence against other human beings, period. It says nothing about dogs. It says nothing about animals. Uh, only a thick libertarian could say that, and we're not thick libertarians. We're thin libertarians. So we sort of have a cop-out. We don't have to answer that question qua libertarian. That would be my answer to that. But uh, getting, getting back to our subject and off the torturing of animals, uh, do you have a, li a right to, you know, there were cases in the, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, Katrina with uh, Louisiana, New Orleans, where people had to abandon their houses and they left animals uh, to die because, you know, the water ran out and, and sometimes they drown. I don't think they were murderers because I, I agree with you. I don't think the animals have rights. Uh, although Murray is very brilliant on that, and let's get off that subject. Suppose we go to Mars and we find these, uh, I don't know, green things that sort of look like, a, I don't know, a, a, an octopus or something. And uh, should we shoot them? <laughs> Do they have rights? And what Murray says is, and here I agree with Murray heartily, uh, if they can petition for their rights and promise to respect our rights and act in a way that's respectful to our rights, even if they look like blue uh, uh, rhinoceroses or whatever it is, we're obligated to respect their rights. But animals, even the smartest of animals like uh, porpoises and uh, chimpanzees are not at that level. But these Martian uh, creatures, if they can petition for their rights and respect our rights, then we have to consider them as rights-bearing creatures, if not human beings, but rights-bearing creatures. But uh, dogs and chimpanzees uh, haven't reached that level, so we we we're not committing a crime if we allow a dog to starve, even though it's pretty heinous to do that. No, I agree. There's a, there's a great uh, I think he's pretty libertarian, although I don't know if he identifies as such. Comedian called Michael Shea, and he, and he had this bit where he was talking about how you know there are some people who say, well, if if you allow uh, gays to get married, uh, then people will marry their animals, and he goes, so. I eat meat. I think I'm pretty much doing the worst thing to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. It sort of reminds me of the joke, uh, what is it, Texas, where uh, men are men and, and sheep are scared or something like that. <laughs> right. Okay, so we've now discussed the first issue about letting babies starve. And we, I hope, agree that uh, you, uh, it would be a violation of rights to do that. You'd be a murderer if you did that. And I hope I've convinced you that we still have libertarianism sacrosanct. Namely, in this analysis, we have not violated the, the, the uh, prohibition of positive obligations. There are no positive obligations. Uh, the only reason you're obligated to go to the orphanage with this baby is not because there are positive obligations, but because if you don't do it, you're a precluder or a forestaller and you're acting incompatibly with libertarians. Okay, now let's get to the second issue, uh, the issue of abortion, or um, uh, what do you call it, pro-life, pro-choice, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, now I've written a lot about this, and I'm hopefully going to come out with a book on this, and I would say that this is one of the most intractable libertarian issues uh, facing us, and not only facing libertarians, but facing uh, the general public. I mean, just to take libertarianism, uh, let me mention two libertarians who I revere and take opposite views on this. One is Murray Rothbard, who is pro-choice. The other is Ron Paul, who is pro-life. Now, you can't get two better libertarians than this, hardly, uh, uh, with the exception of you and I, of course. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, 
and yet they're taking opposite points of view. You don't get any uh, credentialed libertarians like this, like Ron Paul and, and Murray Rothbard, who take opposite views on, I don't know, uh, 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 rent control or minimum wage or um, imperialism or you know legalizing drugs or anything like that. Uh, uh, Ron Paul and Murray Rothbard would agree on, you know, just, and, and you and I would agree on everything, pretty much. Uh, although, you know, there might be another one, maybe immigration, I'm not sure. But uh, so here you have a, a very, very difficult issue, not only for libertarians, but for the general public. I mean, people are, are uh, it's, it's hard to solve this one. Well, happily, I've solved it, or at least to my satisfaction. I don't know about to anyone else's satisfaction. And uh, the view is evictionism. The, the, the pro-choice people say that a woman has a right to evict the child, name uh, the baby, uh, the fetus, to get it out of her womb, and also to kill it. Whereas the pro-life people say, no, 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 the woman doesn't have a right to do either. She has to keep it for nine months, and she certainly can't kill it. She can't evict and can't kill. Evictionism, which I regard as the libertarian compromise, is... Um, uh, the woman has a right to evict, but not to kill. And uh, I think uh, one of the problems of the abortion issue is that it's really a, a complex issue. It's, it's not only uh, killing, it's evicting, and the two are very separate. So, uh, first of all, let me just say that I regard uh, human life uh, that begins with the fertilized egg. The sperm alone will not become a human being, no matter where you put it, no matter what the environment is. The egg alone will not become a human being, uh, or a full human being, uh, if it's not uh, with the sperm. Uh, so the egg alone and the sperm alone can't be a human being. But the fertilized egg, if left in a, a proper environment, namely the womb or a test tube in the future, who knows, uh, will become an adult human being. So I regard uh, the fertilized egg as a rights-bearing creature. Uh, and uh, different people disagree on that. Some people say, well, you know, you don't become human until you're born at, at nine months. But, you know, the baby who is eight and three quarter, eight months and three, uh, three weeks old looks just like the baby uh, and acts just like the baby who is going to be born. Or take a, a baby an hour before birth and a baby an hour after birth. It's the same baby, for God's sakes. Uh, they look alike. They act alike. To say, it seems very arbitrary to say that when you leave a certain environment, you become a human. And, and when you're in that environment, they with the womb... Uh, with, say, a half hour to go before you leave, before you become born, you're not a human being? It, that just seems preposterous to me. And here I disagree with Murray. Murray said that you're not a human being until you're, um, uh, until you're born. By the way, I have to tell you the joke. What is the, um, uh, the viability of the fetus in the Jewish tradition when it graduates medical school? Okay. <laughs> just kidding. Okay. Uh, actually, you can want to pay his taxes. Uh, okay, when it pays taxes, uh, actually the Jewish view is when there's a heartbeat, but I don't see the, that either. I mean, the, the heartbeat seems, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, arbitrary and capricious to me because a baby... Well, that's how you measure death when the heart stops beating. I'm sorry, I can't hear you? You measure death, why shouldn't you measure life when the heart starts? Well, uh, that's a different issue. I mean, uh, you could uh, measure death when the heart stops. That, that, that's, I think, a, a disanalogy. The, the question is, here's a fetus and his heart isn't beating yet, and then one hour later it's going to beat. It doesn't seem to me to be any real big difference because uh, it, it, the baby who's left alone uh, peacefully before the heart beats, will, in an hour, the, his heart will start beating, and I don't see any big difference. So I'm, I'm against the Jewish distinction. I, I favor the... Uh, the Catholic, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic on this, although I was born Jewish and I'm an atheist, so I'm, I'm neither, but I favor the Catholic view, not the Jewish view. Uh, I think the, the, the rights-bearing creature or the rights-bearing entity is the fertilized egg, not the fetus when the heart beats. Okay, so now let's get to um, uh, uh, further points on, on evictionism. Right now, if we adopt evictionism, all babies in the third trimester, seventh, eighth, and ninth months, will be saved. There'll be no more partial birth abortion, which is a real despicable thing, where they go into the womb and they suck out the baby's brains and then they pull the baby out dead. I mean, eh, it's just despicable. It's, it's forestalling because there are other people who would want to adopt that baby, you say, who's seven and a half months in the womb and it's perfectly viable outside. The woman is the owner of the fetus. But the baby is a trespasser, so she has a right to evict the trespasser in the gentlest manner possible. Look, if you put your foot on my lawn 
uh, I don't have a right to shoot you. I, I have to evict you in the gentlest manner possible. I have to say to you, sir, do you realize you're on my lawn? Please get off my lawn. And if you say, oh, well, sorry. I think, to be fair, though, I think, the, I think late-term abortions are typically done when it, the health risk to the mother. I think most people get abortions. Don't wait. So it's, it's really because the mother is going to die if she, if she comes to term. Well, that, that's, that's a different issue. I'm not really interested in the quantity or the percentage. Uh, uh, my point of view is that the mother has a right to evict but not kill for any reason, not just because her health is at, at stake. Certainly, if her health is at stake and she wants to evict, but if her health is at stake, she only has a right to evict. She doesn't have a right to kill. So suppose the mother gets into trouble at eight months, and now she has to get rid of that uh, a trespasser, if you don't mind me using that word. Uh, she has to get rid of the, the fetus. She could just uh, evict it. She doesn't have to kill it. Uh, that'll save her life too. It doesn't matter uh, which way. So uh, in the uh, third trimester, the evictionist theory is just like pro-life, namely the baby is saved. On the other hand, the first six months, evictionism is now um, pro-choice uh, because if you evict the baby after um, three months or four months, uh, the baby will die, and now this is pro-choice. So this evictionism really is a compromise. It's a principled compromise. You know, an unprincipled compromise would be, I say 2 plus 2 is 4, you say 2 plus 2 is 6, so we compromise and we say 2 plus 2 is 5. You know, sort of <laughs> add them up and divide by 2. That's what I call an unprincipled compromise. This is a principled compromise. It comes from libertarian theory. And what it says is that... Uh, 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 the baby who is there uh, against the mother's will is a trespasser, an innocent trespasser, no mens rea. The baby is not guilty of, of, of a crime, but the baby is, 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 a, is a trespasser. Uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson, a philosopher, has a, a very interesting thing. She says, you go to bed tonight, and you wake up tomorrow, and there's this person in bed with you. And you're connected with an umbilical cord from your kidney to this person's kidney. And this person, and you turn to this person and say, what the hell are you doing in my bed? And the guy says, well, I don't know. All I know is I, went, I was in the hospital last night. I was uh, connected to an, uh, a, what do you call it, a kidney dialysis machine. And I surmised that some renegade doctors took me here to your bed. They knocked you out. They connected us. And now I'm working on your, your kidneys. Now, do you have a right to shoot this guy? No. Uh, but do you have to keep them around for nine months or 90 years or whatever? No, not either. Namely, you can evict them in the gentlest manner possible. What you should do, and this is not a positive obligation because if you don't do this, you're a murderer. You, you just can't shoot them or, or cut the, uh, the cord. What you have to do is call the hospital and say, hey, <laughs> call a different hospital you know, where they don't have these crazy doctors and say, hey, I got this guy attached to me. I'd like to be detached and you know, put him on a, back on a kidney dialysis machine so uh, you know, he'll live. Uh, he's, he's not at fault. Uh, but I'm not keeping him around for the next nine months or the next 90 years or for the rest of my life. Uh, so I think the, the baby is like that. If, you, uh, if a woman has a baby, uh, whether she agreed to it or it was a case of rape, or it doesn't matter, there's a, a, a baby in her that she doesn't want in her, she has a right to evict it but not kill it. Now, the benefit of this evictionism is that as medical technology improves, we will get more and more pro-life. And I'm sort of pro-life uh, uh, spiritually or emotionally because I love human beings. I'm a pro-human being person. Sue me. I like human beings. And the fewer of them that are killed, uh, the better I like it. And I don't like uh, babies being killed because I regard babies or fetuses as human beings. See, in 10 years, instead of the last uh, uh, trimester, maybe it'll be the last 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th, or 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth month. And then maybe in 20 years, it'll, we'll go down to the 5th month. And maybe in 50 years, we'll go down to the 4th month. You know that in 200 years, if we don't blow ourselves up uh, in the interim, babies will be viable outside of the womb uh, at day one. Namely, you take a fertilized egg and you put it in a test tube or some super-duper test tube, and the baby will be just as good as in the womb. And at that point, uh, we uh, evictionists will have achieved pro-life without hurting the pro-choice people, namely without hurting the pro-choice people in evictionism. I mean, the pro-choice people, they want to actually kill them. Uh, there are women who will say, well, I don't want that man's baby to live. Well, the, the woman has no right to say that. She, she can't say that, even if it's a rapist, she, because the, the product of rape is an innocent person. Uh, I so uh, I think that um, uh, 
she has a right to uh, evict but never to kill. Now what you say is if you throw somebody into the river, you have an obligation to pick them out of the river uh, because you shouldn't have been throwing them in the river in the first place. And I think that that's a good objection, I, and I do deal with that objection in my uh, writings, and let me try to deal with it now. I think there's a disanalogy between throwing someone in the river and becoming pregnant and creating a person. Because throwing someone in the river against their will is, is an act of violence. It's an act of uh, aggression. It's a violation of the libertarian uh, principles of non-aggression. You throw somebody in a river or the lake, you're a bad guy. But you, you create life. It's a disanalogy. You, you're, you're not... Uh, we're not putting all pregnant women in jail for, for throwing people in rivers. Uh, so just because you get pregnant uh, doesn't mean that you uh, are, are, are uh, uh, a rights violator. It doesn't mean you're a criminal, whereas throwing people in the river does mean you're a criminal, so there's a disanalogy there. Now, I would say uh, that when, when you give someone life by birthing him or by uh, allowing a sperm to hit an egg, what you're doing is improving the situation. Take the the Mormon uh, philosophy. I, I know a little bit about Mormonism because I was once uh, uh, trying to get a job at Brigham Young University, and what they believe is that there are spirits out there who then come into the fertilized egg. So I asked myself, where are the spirits better off, out there in the spiritual land or in, in embodied in a person? And I think that if there are spirits out there, and you know, I'm, I'm an atheist, so I don't believe in any of this stuff, but if there are, uh, the mother is improving the spirit's situation by giving the spirit life for you know five minutes. And then if she evicts it and the spirit dies, well, uh, at least the, the spirit lived for five minutes. So I, I think there's a, a very big disanalogy there. Uh, another interesting point is uh, take the case where you're about to be hit by an onrushing truck. And if I don't push you out of the way of the truck, you're going to die. We stipulate that that's the truth, even though we never know for sure, but we stipulate that that's true. But then what happens is when I push you out of the way of the truck, I pushed you into the river. <laughs> Got it? <laughs> so here's a case of pushing you into the river because, because the truck, is, you know, is the, the highway is right near the river or right near the lake. So I push you out of the way of the truck, and now you're, you're drowning. And do I have an obligation to save you? No. I don't. This would no, be, you do, still. I think I don't, and here we might disagree. And my idea here is, did I improve your situation by pushing you out of the way of the truck, or did I worsen it? Obviously, I improved it, because if I didn't push you out of the way of the truck, you're, de you're dead. This way, you're alive for another minute or so while you're wobbling in the water. And let's say I can't swim, uh, and there's no one else around, and there's no pole that I can give you. Am I a murderer? No, I saved your life, God damn it! You should be more grateful. <laughs> because well, you, you, you saved, saved my life, life only to allow me to die a second later, so not, not really. A second later, it took a whole minute for you to die. Be a little bit more grateful, will you please? So instead of a quick instantaneous death, you let me be tortured first. I don't oh, know man. if that's going to Well, it. let's abstract from that. Let's just talk about how long your life was. Your life is now one minute longer, and who knows what can happen in a minute. A helicopter can come get you. The, the point is... You never know what the result is going to be, but I saved your life. I pushed you out of the way of the truck. You know, it's interesting. Supp forget about the river. Suppose I pushed you out of the way of the truck, and I broke your ribs. And now you're lying there with broken ribs, but alive instead of uh, being dead. And now you sue me for breaking your ribs because, you know, I, I did push you. Um, I, I would say that any libertarian court worthy of its name would say, hey, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, give Walter a break. He saved your life, for God's sakes. Or they might say, well, it was really a complex act. He saved your life and broke your rib. And uh, the saving of the life greatly outweighs the broken, breaking of the rib. And therefore, you ought to pay Walter instead of whining and complaining about him breaking your rib. But now we're getting off the point. Uh, onto a different interesting libertarian uh, discussion, but still, uh, so I think evictionism is the only proper uh, libertarian analysis. I've been writing about this for years. I, I think my first article was in the 1970s on this, and and uh, I must have written maybe 15 articles, and I've got maybe 10 people criticizing me on this in the literature, and I've got 10 refutations of them. And I'm glad to be able to talk about this again because we'll publicize this in this way a little bit more. 
and I, I think that evictionism is the only uh, libertarian uh, analysis. And and you know, you talk about attracting people to libertarianism. Well, I think if ever this got popularized, if ever some mainstream person would take it up, this would really attract many people to our banner because this is such an intractable, horrendously difficult philosophical issue and we libertarians are now coming along with the uh, with the uh, answer to it and I think we'll attract a lot of people to our banner if people will hear of it and I think it's the correct view and I think it's a principled compromise and I think all the refutations of it you know like the, the woman purposely got pregnant and you know all sorts of objections are just wrong I, I think that uh, evictionism is, is the, the only libertarian way to go all right um, yeah I, I think I pretty much agree with that uh, now another topic, and I, it, it's sort of interesting because I, I was on a, a broadcast recently by this guy, Mike. I'm, I'm mispronouncing his name, but uh, and he basically said he's a libertarian. He said to me that Let he me believes. What's, what's his name, Mike? What? Uh, C U E N O. I don't know how to pronounce it. Cunio, uh, you know, yeah. something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. And uh, I think. He, yeah, I think maybe he's had you on his podcast, like 420 pod Libertarian or something. And he said that he believes that the only person who should be punished is a person who commits uh, pay you to kill uh, my wife. I shouldn't uh, be responsible because you possess free will, and it's your fault for listening to me. Let's say you don't do it. Then my wife isn't killed. So I guess I want – and I sort of disagreed with him on that, but I – it is an interesting uh, point of view, so I guess, I guess I want to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, no, Mike is a bright guy, and he's a good libertarian. I mean, who else would come up with, with a thing like this? Uh, no, but I disagree with him. I agree with you. Uh, I mean, let's suppose Hitler never killed anyone personally. He never uh, shot anyone. He never uh, did anything. Uh, he threatened. He said to the, his generals, go kill the Jews, go kill the whoever the the the, uh, the non-Aryans or whoever they are, the blacks, the gays, whatever, uh, the Romani. Uh, and if you don't, I'm going to execute you. And then the general went and said, okay, uh, captain, tell the lieutenant to tell the uh, corporal to go kill the Jews or the, the, the bad guys from the Aryan point of view, from the, the Nazi point of view. And what this view you would say was only the guy who actually pulled the trigger is, is guilty. Right? That, that's the view. Well, well, no, that's not. That's, hold, sorry to interrupt. That's not actually his view because I I talked to him about this and he said under duress, yes. If you threaten, if I say to you, hurt me for I'll beat you up, then yes, because I'm threatening violence. But if I say murder my wife and I'll give you money, but if you don't murder my wife, well, then you simply won't get money. Then there's no. Uh, that's not duress. And well, he would say in that case, that okay. person should not be punished. Yeah, but. Uh, the rest is necessary, but not uh, rather sufficient, but not necessary. There are other ways of uh, getting into trouble. Look, I'm the getaway driver for the, uh, the the murderous gang, and what the murderous gang does is it goes around shooting people, and then I drive them away and I uh, escape with them. Am I innocent? I mean, <laughs> I'm part of the goddamn gang. Wait, I shouldn't say that. The New York Times is going to say that I'm part of a, a murderous gang. Uh, this is just hypothetical. Uh, if I'm a getaway driver or if I'm uh, working in, in some way with a computer or, some, or getting uh, guns for them or something like that, I'm aiding and abetting them. Uh, I can be part of the criminal gang without actually pulling a trigger, so there are a lot of ways to become guilty without actually doing this. Uh, you know, uh, So I, I think that Mike is an interesting fellow and he's an important libertarian, but I think he's wrong on this issue. I think that there are other ways of being guilty other than either threatening or actually physically uh, shooting somebody. There's also working with or aiding and abetting, being part of the criminal gang, uh, uh, getting a, a plan for the, the uh, uh, where the bank keeps its money or something like that, You know, get, getting the architectural things so you can do better robberies or whatever. Uh, all of this is uh, part of the gang uh, activities. Uh, look, the Godfather, uh, we were talking about the Godfather before uh, in, in the Godfather movie. I don't know that maybe when the Godfather was a young blood, he was killing people. But when he, uh, when he was uh, an elderly Godfather, he wasn't killing anyone anymore. 
uh, he would have other people do it, but he organized it. He aided and abetted. He was part of the gang. Uh, uh, you know the accountant for for the gang uh, that tries to keep uh, track of uh, the resources or whatever. Uh, the, the cook uh, for the gang uh, is. Uh, uh, see, I, I agree with you. I I, I remember once my mother uh, always is trying to convince me to go join the army, which I don't know why she she <laughs> works for the the VA and knows the side effects that PTSD causes. But um, you know she's like you don't have to actually be you don't actually have to be in combat to be in the army. And I said to my mother, should you be a chef for the Nazis? Anything to do to help is immoral. Yes, absolutely. I, I agree. Uh, interesting. Uh, when I got my PhD in economics, you know what my mother said? She said, now will you go to law school? <laughs> <laughs> And, and she didn't, and you know, I was thinking of law school because I'm interested in legal, uh, <laughs> but no, she didn't want me to do that. She wanted me to, you know, make a lot of money out of uh, trying cases or something like that. So, you know, we're, we're uh, two Jewish boys who were uh, disappointments to their Jewish mothers, but what, what can you do? Yeah. Yeah. So, no, no, so it's, yeah. So, I, I, I mean, also, I, I think it's, I think the, I mean, now, certain times, uh, I, it can be crazy. Like there, there was an incident where a guy is in jail without the parole, and he had a party, and he was drunk, and someone said, "Can I borrow your car?" And they used his car and committed a robbery and a murder, and he is in jail without the possibility of parole for lending them the car. Now that's crazy. That is way too far removed, and that's just you know it's excessive. So. Obviously, you know, there would have to be, uh, you're consciously, purposefully helping. It's not you lend someone, I sell you a gun unknowingly and to a murderer. Look, uh, the guy who sold the murderous gang shoes, you know, let's say you can't commit murder without shoes. <laughs> you need shoes, otherwise it's hard to, you know, commit murder. Let's stipulate that. So the guy goes into a shoe store the day before and he buys some shoes. It's not the shoemaker's fault that the, the guy committed the murder. Or a taxi driver, you know, the gang calls a taxi and says, you know, take me to here, and they take him. And the taxi driver is innocent even though he, um, the, he drove him there. Well, let's say take Hitler's mother and father. I mean, uh, Hitler's the bad guy, and uh, the, but the mother isn't responsible for that. I mean, you know, uh, she did her best, but somehow Hitler had a bad seed or whatever it was. Uh, well, I know what it was. It was U.S. getting in, involved in World War I that created that, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, uh, off the point, but interesting, um, a lot of people say, well, you know, uh, if you want to have uh, libertarianism and non-aggression and isolationism, uh, you know, what about Hitler? That, that's the uh, 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 the refutation of us uh, uh, non-warmongering libertarians. And my answer is, look, uh, the reason we had a, a Hitler being a Hitler as opposed to being a house painter is because of World War One. Uh, World War One was, uh, you know, fought to a tie from 1914 to 1917. The, they were just fighting over three inches of uh, of uh, ditches or whatever it was. Uh, and probably in another year or so, the war would have ended because they would have ran out of soldiers, and uh, that would have been it. And there wouldn't have been any real big problem. Instead, the U.S. put its big fat thumb on on the balance, and uh, the, mainly because. Uh, the ruling class in the U.S. had more uh, bonds in, in England than in, um, in Germany. And uh, they won the war, and uh, now uh, Germany was, uh, World War I was declared the, the most evil, monstrous, whatever, total responsibility for the war. And you had the Treaty of Versailles, which was very, very punitive. Even our man Kane said that. And this sort of led through uh, the German hyperinflation of 1923 and taxes and stuff like that. And now you got a demagogue like Hitler who arises in the, the late 20s or early 30s. Had the U.S. not got into it, Hitler would have been a house painter, would be my refutation of this uh, objection uh, to us, uh, us uh, libertarians. And my reputation would be Switzerland. Uh, he didn't attack Switzerland. They're not warmongers. In fact, I think Switzerland is a great example of you don't attack people who trade with you. 
<laughs> not only trade with you, but uh, live in the mountains and ski and shoot, uh, <laughs> and our Aryans too. I mean, the Swiss were sort of, uh, you know, light-skinned uh, people mostly. But I think uh, that's a very good point that uh, Ron Paul wants the U.S. to be a giant Switzerland. Namely, very powerful. Uh, nobody's going to attack us. We anyone attacks us, we kick their butt. But we don't export democracy and you know uh, export this and make everything uh, hunky dory. We don't become the policemen of the world. We're pretty inept. We can't even deliver the mail. And uh, what we're doing in Iraq is supporting ISIS. We created ISIS uh, because we were attacking Bashar, and Bashar was yeah, fighting yeah. the people who became ISIS. So the whole thing is crazy. They they created ISIS, not we. Sorry. Sorry, I stand corrected. Lou Rockwell is always telling me to stop saying it. I can't. I, it's just sort of <laughs> um, old dogs, new tricks. I mean, I certainly agree with you. We didn't do it. We're innocent. It's they who it's did like it. It's like Jerry Seinfeld has a bit where every time people uh, win, uh, pl win uh, a world, people get, go, we won. And Jerry Seinfeld's like, no, they won. You watched. <laughs> Good old Jerry. Well, too bad he's not a libertarian, but what the heck? But he's right on that. Right I on that. Corrected. Right. So, um, anyways, uh, what were we saying? Yeah. So, uh, I think another argument um, to to that is having a government doesn't prove that we're safe because there are governments that have big, powerful armies that get defeated by other governments. I mean, the fact that that Canada has an army doesn't mean that they're safe. You know, so uh, having a government with an army is no guarantee. Otherwise, every government with an army, and there are these like Monaco, which which are safe. So uh, that's not you can't determine from that that simply uh, having a government military is going to keep you safe. That's that's certainly true. There was a case in Canada where somebody went up and shot a a guard, a ceremonial guard who was standing in front of the parliament or some. I forget the exact thing, but. Uh, he, he, just some kid uh, in a soldier's uniform uh, guarding the parliament, but sort of more ceremonial. And some Muslim, I think, I'm not sure, uh, shot him. And the Canadians were outraged. How could they do this? This is despicable. But look at it from the point of view of the, uh, the uh, Arab people. Uh, Canada just... Uh, Brought I don't know six or eight airplanes to start bombing the uh, the, the people in in uh, Iraq or I'm not sure where Syria somewhere. Uh, you know once you start in, uh, Ron Paul says you know you start I'm putting words in his mouth but I think this is the gist of it. If you take a stick and poke it in a hornet's nest, don't be shocked that the, some of the hornets come back and bite you. I mean uh, he was part of the Canadian Army. And the Canadian Army is attacking these people, and these people don't much like being bombed by Canada or the U.S. or anyone else, and uh, they're, they're fighting back. It's called blowback, and, and yet the Canadians were so outraged and shocked that, you know, that, that this is despicable, but the Canada's bombing them. Now, what the hell are they? They never attacked Canada, uh, or, well, they did attack the U.S. Uh, with the 9-11 thing, but the, that, too, was blowback. Uh, Ron Paul would say and did say uh, to Rudy Giuliani, they're here because we were there first. If we didn't go there first, they wouldn't come here. They're not attacking us because, you know, we have mini skirts or uh, rap music or whatever it is. I mean, they have that in Norway and, and uh, Sweden and other places like that, Switzerland. Uh, they're not attacking the Swiss uh, people, although they're a little weak on the Danish thing with the cartoons. I admit that that was, <laughs> that was certainly improper and uh, the people who are responsible for that should be uh, severely punished. Yeah, I agree. And I, I really like, I mean, I, I mean, the term isolationist is obviously a smear word. It's not interventionist. I mean, calling me an isolationist because I don't break my neighbor's windows is ridiculous. Uh, isolationist is someone who says, I don't want to engage in trade. I we're the opposite of isolationist. We, we, we don't support tariffs. We don't support embargoes. I mean, what's more isolationist than that? Well, you know, uh, the words keep changing their meaning. Uh, at one time, liberal was good, uh, the classical liberal. That was us. We were the liberals. And then the, the bad guys, our friends on the left, uh, stole the word from us. It used to be that isolationism meant roughly what non-interventionism means now. And even Ron Paul had to say, no, no, I'm not an isolationist. Uh, but in the old terminology, he is. And we are isolationists just uh, in terms of military. Certainly we're not isolationists 
in terms of trade or movement of peoples or anything like that. Just uh, we're non-imperialists. We don't believe in taking soldiers and sending them over there and shooting people that haven't uh, done any any wrong to us. We don't believe in initiating violence, only in defending against. And then the, the, these people attack us that we really are against the defense. Like they, they say that, well, Ron Paul doesn't favor defense. Well, of course he favors defense, and he distinguishes between defense and offense. I mean, you know, basketball season, the NBA is now starting in college basketball. Those people who watch that game, they can distinguish between offense and defense. When the other team has got the ball, they yell, defense, defense. Somehow they can't distinguish uh, non-interventionism or isolationism in the old sense from uh, from uh, not having a defense. Uh just uh, uh, another question. Um, I guess uh, your opinions on, um, uh, you know, um, since government is a criminal gang, uh, what what do you think of uh, people, or uh, what what should happen to people who, like, give more money to the state than they need to? Like a per like to me, I think if a person pays more taxes than they have to, uh, even if a person who advocates high taxes, I want it to be a hypocrite on this aspect. You know, uh, I think it's, you know, I mean, I'm an atheist, but I like churches because they don't pay taxes. Um, uh, I, so, I, I, I mean, I think anyone who gives to the state more than they have to, in my opinion, you know, to me that's like paying a hitman. I mean, I, I don't know. I, should that be allowable? I agree with you, and uh, my uh, response to this is sort of I believe in the uh, Nuremberg Trials. What happened after World War II is we had the Nuremberg Trials, and we had something similar in um, Japan. Now, I don't believe that what they did was, uh, was absolutely correct. Uh, th that's a whole other story. But let's suppose that we, libert we libertarians take over, and we have a Nuremberg Trial for uh, statists. Uh, and, you know, uh, Barbara Streisand, say, is donating money to the government. Well, what do we think of that? Well, that, that's a crime. She shouldn't be doing that. I don't mean to pick on her personally. There are a lot of people that do that, but anyone who gives uh, the government more than they're obligated to, uh, that they're coerced to, or even apart from taxes, just makes a donation to government, is donating to a criminal gang. And uh, when the Nuremberg trial comes, that is the Libertarian Nuremberg trial, uh, they're going to be in the dock, and I believe uh, in ex post facto law, uh, uh, namely, that just because it's legal right now to give money to the government, certainly not a crime, the government hasn't outlawed that, I think it's a libertarian crime, and I think people who do that uh, should look over their shoulders because, you know, what do they say, black power is going to get your mama or something? Well, we libertarians are going to get your mama one day, and when we do, we, uh, you're going to be in trouble for uh, donating uh, money to, to this evil, monstrous uh, institution that uh, uh, kills people and innocent people and puts them in jail for uh, smoking pot or uh, engaging in uh, consensual adult behavior, prostitution, pornography, what have you. Uh, th that's a very bad thing to give money to the government. Right. I mean, the response uh, to that, though, typically is, well, I thought you my money, and I and I just believe I'm giving my money to the candidate that I think is the best. Why am I not entitled to spend my money on a candidate that I think is best? You know, we just disagree, and it's my re it's my money, not yours. Well, wait, you just changed it a little. Before you were talking about giving money to the government, now you're talking about giving money to candidates. Uh, I mean, I donated money to Ron Paul. Uh, Ron Paul was a candidate. I don't want to be in the dock for giving money to Ron Paul, who I think will, you know, promote liberty. Uh, now it's an interesting question. Suppose you give money to uh, Barack Obama or to uh, Hillary. Right. Bill or... Maher gave a million dollars to Obama. I'm sorry. Who gave a million? Bill Maher gave a million dollars to Obama. Bill Maher. Bill Maher. Uh, I don't. I don't know who he is, but uh, that's a little different. Uh, I think, than giving money to the IRS. Before, I, un, I interpreted you as saying giving money to the IRS or giving money to the U.S. Treasury. I think it's a little different giving money to a, uh, a politician, but certainly giving money to uh, Ron Paul uh, would not be a problem. And uh, giving money to uh, Barack Obama or Hillary or John McCain or uh, uh, Romney or any of those people would be more of a problem. It's very similar to uh, teaching in a public school. 
uh, I, I'm now at a private school, but the private schools nowadays get a lot of money from government, so they're quasi-public schools. And before I came here, I was a professor at Rutgers and um, Baruch College and University of Central Arkansas, all of which are public universities. And the question is, should I uh, have accepted a salary from them? And I did. And my answer is, well, I was promoting liberty and good economics. Well, what about a Marxist professor who was taking money from uh, the government to uh, promote Marxism or whatever uh, evil, uh, monstrous... Um, uh, I think people like that are, are going to have to worry when, when libertarians uh, uh, take over the reins because uh, I don't think that that would be justified. So it would be similar to giving money to the... Uh, to the IRS, you know, teaching. Yeah. I guess. I guess my response, although I don't know, it, it depends. So you know, if 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 you know, people say we're going to take a vote on you know to kill Bob, and you know, should should and 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 the vote is Bob dies. I would say that the people who vote to kill Bob uh, should perhaps be in trouble, but not just the very act of voting itself. Huh. Yes. So yeah. if you if you give money to a candidate who's clearly uh, there's no evidence that he's aggressive, then that's different. But if you give candidate where there's plenty of evidence that's very easy to find that this guy is no good and is dangerous, then I think that's a different issue. Yes, I uh, I I hate to agree with you so much because it's <laughs> less controversy, but uh, uh, I have to agree. We've only got three more minutes uh, because this is uh, like an hour. I, I've got a I've got an appointment, but uh, I just wanted to say it's always a delight, and I'll I'll be happy to uh, do this again with you. Uh, you always ask me provocative questions. We always get get into it, as they say, and and I think we we together promote liberty. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. That was fun. Well, take care. Be in touch. You too. And send me the URL for this. Um, I will uh, do so. Thanks. Great. Take care. Bye now.